There was a kid who was giving hand and arm signals, and our platoon leader actually had told me to fire a warning shot his way. But it was kind of crazy. We had just gotten this vehicle. I'd never had a chance to zero in the sights. When I took it to the test fire pit, I couldn't really tell where it was shooting. It looked like it was shooting way to the right. So I kind of put my reticle right on the kid, thinking that it was going to shoot to the right. We'll hear that it was actually the weapon was zeroed in. Being under constant assault in a war zone wears a person down in both expected and unexpected ways. Sure, it wears you down physically, psychologically, and emotionally, but also it can wear down your soul, taking chips out of your humanity. It's not merely that you begin to lose a sense of what's right and wrong, so much as you start to lose a sense of why those distinctions even matter. You know, it's changed me as a person, a lot. I was getting very cold and numb to things that you probably shouldn't get cold and numb towards, you know. You don't look at kids the same way anymore, at least for a period of time. Yeah, it's fucked up. That's the most blunt way to put it. It's fucked up. We take that for granted here. You know, you see kids around and you want to see them happy, you know, with toys and all that. Not in a war zone. No kid should ever have to go through that. Joe Post had wanted to be in the military for most of his life. He liked the notions of honor and bravery and discipline. He liked the idea of being a part of something. He was tough and reliable and wanted to prove it. He wanted to test it. It can sound a little cliche, but he truly wanted to serve his country. And he did. Even though the experience was pretty much the way he expected it to be, Joe didn't count on the ways that military service would change him. When he enlisted, he couldn't imagine ever leaving the army. By the time his tour was done, he couldn't imagine staying in for one moment longer. There's something that both physical and psychological scars have in common. They don't have to be catastrophic to be life-altering. What is true bravery? What makes a hero a hero? Tested by the worries of what's happening at home, thousands of miles away, and the reality of what you're facing here and now. When your life is in danger every second, and it's either kill or be killed. From Wondery and Incongruity Media, this is Anthony Russo, and this is war. We all know a guy like Joe Post. He's unapologetically patriotic, but not in a bumper sticker kind of way. Rather, his brand of patriotism comes with an undeniable earnestness. Although he wanted nothing more than to serve in the Navy as his father had, his parents weren't too keen on the idea. They talked him out of joining when he was finishing up high school, impressing upon him that instead he should find a different path. He took his associate's degree in construction management and was toying with getting a bachelor's degree when the towers fell. That changed everything. Joe wanted to enlist. But he'd been in a little bit of trouble, and that threw up some barriers that prevented him from getting in easily. So he turned his sights back to his life, and back to finishing up school. I mean, I wasn't ever in, like, serious trouble. I did get in trouble for a DUI when I was 22, and that was what kind of put the brakes on everything. After that, I started straightening up some. You know, I had to keep my nose clean if I wanted to join the Army. The time was right. You know, I was kind of one of those guys that, you know, had the ribbon on my truck, you know, support the troops, that whole thing. I figured the best way to support them was join them, you know. And so in 2005, I enlisted. One of the really important ways that 9-11 was different from, say, Pearl Harbor was that after Pearl Harbor, there was a huge spike in outrage enlistment. And while there were some in the U.S., it wasn't the same. After all, there was no world war going on in 2001 or any national debate about whether the U.S. should join a war. It wasn't just a total surprise. It was a total surprise without context. As the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq began to take on a protracted feel, U.S. enlistments faded rather than grew. The Army in particular was suffering a recruitment crisis, and they had to find new ways to fill their ranks. 
when I first started looking at, into it again, you know, it was via the Army website. You kind of fill out your information through there, and then the recruiter contacts you. But when I was doing it, they were civilian recruiters. They weren't actually guys currently active in the military. It was a pilot program. I don't think it ever really took off. The guy that I dealt with was actually a retired Army, but there were people in that office that were never in the Army. There was a guy that was retired Navy. So it was almost like a sales position more than anything. Although at the time, the Army made headlines for reducing the mental and physical requirements for enlistees, there also were reduced rules for age and previous criminal histories. While Joe wasn't a criminal, he did have a DUI, and the waivers were a little easier to get in 2005 than they had been previously. Joe's parents, who weren't thrilled about the idea of military service when he was 18 and there was no war on, were surprisingly circumspect when, at 25, he told them he would enlist. After all, when a child says they want to be in the Army, you can brush it off. Similarly with a high school student. But Joe was a man now, and he clearly had a vision for himself in a life of military service. You know, they understood where I was coming from. In fact, my dad served in the Navy during Vietnam era. He had me go before I joined down to Washington, D.C. and see the Vietnam Wall before I would actually sign on the dotted line just to kind of get an idea, you know the gravity of what I was getting myself into. He wanted to make sure I was taking it seriously. I I just think he wanted me to reevaluate it, make sure it's what I really wanted to do, which, you know, I think is a good thing. You know, it's serious stuff. I mean, it's war. It's a lot easier to see what was going on in retrospect. Joe's father wasn't trying to scare him. He was just trying to give him a sense of the gravity of military service during wartime. What's interesting, though, is that the lesson we ought to take away from war memorials isn't the most obvious one. We acknowledge the sacrifice and recognize that there were lives ended and changed forever. But, especially when we're thinking about fallen soldiers, our minds stay with the death and with the sacrifice. The picture of Joe taking in the war memorials on the Washington Mall is meant to evoke the idea that he understood the seriousness of what he was about to undertake. The lesson is something like, a lot of people die, and you very well may be one of them. The missing lesson, though, might be as important, and it is this. If you survive combat, you still will be forever changed. There is no way back. No one seeing the kind of carnage that results in casualties worthy of a war memorial at home. Joe was ready to serve, and to do his duty, and it was pretty much all he had ever wanted. But the part of the call to duty that so few military people consider is not just about life and death. It is about living and dying well. The rule changes removed a lot of the minor obstacles for would-be soldiers like Joe, and were part of the reason the U.S. was prepared for the troop surge just two years later in 2007. For now, another upside was that, at 25, even though he was older than most of the recruits in basic training, he wasn't the oldest by far, and Joe would get to realize his goal of being a member of the U.S. military. There were some guys that were even older than I was, but I was definitely older than than most. I mean, I did all right. I definitely was in good enough shape. Even though I worked construction and stuff, I was the kind of guy, you know, had a little bit of a beer belly and, and that, but the first couple of weeks, even if you're in shape, I think it's, it's more the mental aspect than anything. You know, the lack of sleep, all that, it's challenging. I think being older definitely helped me. I was a little more mature and you, know, you kind of realize that everything they're doing, they're doing it to screw with you. <laughs> it was 2005. I think the hardest part is the first two weeks. That's what they call red phase. And that's just because it's such a shock to your system and you're not getting much sleep. And I was in an all male company. It's a bunch of people from all over the country and, you know, various walks of life. People tend to get into fights with guys and you're getting punished because other guys screw up. So it's, it's stressful. It's designed to be that way though. And and you kind of pick up on that quickly. At least, you know, I know some of us did. You realize what they're trying to do, but even still the lack of sleep, it's, it's pretty intense especially when you're not used to it. Because he had a college degree, and because he was a little bit older, Joe was selected for the Warrior Leadership Course, WLC. 
Even though by now the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were fully underway, the build-up was still in its nascent phase. The end of major combat in Iraq had been more than two years before, and it was clear that the missions in both Iraq and Afghanistan were changing. Joe was part of a stand-up unit, that is, one that was essentially being built from scratch. So, when he arrived at Fort Hood after completing his training, the place had a surreal ghost town quality. I was an E-4 when I came in because I was a college grad, so that's a specialist in the Army. And I was pretty much thrust into a leadership position right away because of that rank and being a college grad and being that I was in a stand-up unit. There wasn't very many NCOs there yet, hardly any officers. So it was kind of interesting, you know, I'm new to the Army, going to a new unit, and it was really just kind of getting things organized is what you're doing. And more and more people just keep coming in. I went to what they called WLC. They sent me there. As soon as I graduated from there, I got sent to another unit on post. There was 20 of us from 59th and our sister company, 572nd, that got sent to the 43rd CEC. So they weren't quite finished by the time I left there, but it, it can take some time. And 43rd was part of the 3rd ACR, 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment, and they had just moved from Fort Carson, Colorado. So they were still kind of getting new people in and stuff too. So there wasn't a lot of people there yet either. It was kind of went to more of the same, basically. The Army was moving personnel around, partly in response to the wave of new soldiers coming in, and partly in response to the increased demand for troops. When Joe and the other soldiers were training and moving between companies in 2006, the wheels already were in motion for the troop surge. Although he would not deploy until the fall of 2006, by the beginning of 2007, more and more troops would be ready for deployment. There was a prevailing belief that the Iraq insurgency was teetering and that with one final blow, the U.S. could deliver a knockout punch and end it. When the surge came, it would be the Army's job to make it look easy, so there was an amount of scrambling to get the right pieces in place. Joe ended up in the 43rd Combat Engineer Company, which would eventually grow to be the largest unit of its kind, self-sufficient and numbering around 200 soldiers. It is important to get a clear picture here. Joe didn't have any illusions about what military life would hold for him, or at least he didn't feel like he did. He knew it would be dangerous, and that with every day, the likelihood of him going to combat became more like a certainty. Joe didn't have any concerns there. He knew he would be brave enough, and he knew he would get into whatever shape was needed. What he didn't know, what he couldn't have known, was that in war, there are different tests. Tests of character and honor, as well as of bravery and strength. That seems obvious, but there's also a test of humanity, of how well you let your humanity show through under difficult and violent circumstances. How you balance the preservation of your life with the protection of, or value of, others' lives. It was this last test that would push Joe to his limits and allow him to see the downside of being tough and prepared. Remember, he had wanted to be in the military all of his life. And he would serve with valor. And it would take him years to fully understand the gravity of that decision. I've been a Dollar Shave Club member for a couple years now. I got the executive razor, which was a lot more razor than I needed, because I don't have to shave every day but it has this trimmer edge on top that makes it a little easier for me to get under my nose. For me, though, the best part was I never had to treat myself to a sharp razor and a clean shave. They just became part of the way I lived. Plus, it was cool knowing there was always another blade available and that there were more on their way. I never had to run to the store and go get one, which is great because there aren't any worse chores for me than going to the store. After a couple months, my wife said she wanted a subscription as well, she gets the Twin Blades every other month, because that's an option for people who don't burn through razors very quickly. More recently, they sent along a couple of sample sizes of their other products. In addition to razors, Dollar Shave Club has shave butter, shampoo, body wash, toothpaste, everything you need to look, smell, and feel your best. I switched away from shave foam to shave cream a while ago, and Dollar Shave Club's Dr. Carver's shave butter is as good as I've had. It goes on clear, which is weird at first 
but there are worse things than being able to see where you're shaving. The best part for me, though, is once you find all the products you like, you can just get them. I always feel a little stupid standing in the soap aisle trying to find the one thing that I always use. Dollar Shave Club sends me as much as I need when I need it. They're always the products I already know I like, so there's no confusion or running out. You don't have to set foot in a store, wandering the aisles hunting for razors, shampoo, body wash, toothpaste, none of it. Test drive everything they have. You're definitely going to find something that you like. Clean up your bathroom and your morning routine. Join Dollar Shave Club today for just $5 with free shipping and you'll get the six-blade executive razor plus trial sizes of shave butter, body cleanser, and one-wipe Charlie's. Then, keep the blades coming for a few bucks more a month. Get yours at dollarshaveclub.com slash thisiswar. That's dollarshaveclub.com slash thisiswar. Hims, a new wellness brand for men. There are a few things as tedious as going to the doctor's office and hanging around and hanging around just to get permission to get something you know will make your life better. Sure, sometimes you need to get something looked at, but if you know what the problem is, you're really just getting permission to solve it. This was the main problem the company Hims was trying to solve when they launched forhims.com. The idea was to take common, easily diagnosed issues for men and take away the anxiety and tedium of going to the doctor. If there's a common problem and a well-known solution, why spend one day making an appointment, waiting and waiting for the appointment to arrive, just to spend another day to get a prescription to address it? More than two-thirds of men suffer hair loss by the time they're 35, and that number just goes up as you get older. ED starts to become an issue for 40% of men over 40, and that number just goes up as well. Both of these issues have scientific solutions, that is, medicine not herbal solutions or any other kind of snake oil. But for a really long time, it was tough to get your hands on medical solutions. It isn't anymore. Two things have happened that have made the HIMS solution possible. The first was that patents ran out on the formerly expensive drugs that addressed hair loss and ED. It made them affordable for people who really needed them. The second was a technological revolution that made telemedicine gain traction, letting doctors do some diagnoses remotely. It works like this. Go to 4 and fill out a survey about your general health and your specific concerns. A U.S. board-licensed doctor reviews it and writes a prescription based on your personal requirements and needs. Then HIMS fills the prescription and sends it along in discreet packaging. That's it. Check out the 4 website to get a sense of the kind of company they really are. The site has plenty of lifestyle articles from men's writers with insights on everything from cocktails to grooming. It's a great site to just go on and read, and it's a good central starting off point that gives you tips you can't find all in one place. Order now. My listeners get a trial month of hymns for just $5 today, right now, while supplies last. See the website for full details. This would cost hundreds if you went to the doctor or a pharmacy. Go to 4 slash this is war. That's F-O-R-H-I-M-S dot com slash this is war. For hymns dot com slash this is war. Combat ready. It's an odd kind of phrase, because combat is only something you might be ready for the second time. Technically, it means you have the equipment and the training to go into a combat situation. From that perspective, of course the members of the 43 CEC were combat ready. They had enlisted and been trained in general and specialized jobs that support warfare. Many had done so explicitly to become part of America's fighting force abroad. The group had flown to Kuwait and spent a couple of weeks training, getting used to the climate as well as they could. They were ready and as capable as they could have been. For his part, Joe was ready. He doesn't even remember the particulars about the day before he headed into Iraq. He didn't have much apprehension. He remembers trying to catch a nap and traveling two hours to Iraq in a C-130 that he says flew like a dump truck. He does remember the few minutes before landing pretty well, though. You do, like, they call it a combat drop-in. The plane basically just drops straight down. It's kind of weird feeling. It's like being in an elevator, you know, like when an elevator drops real fast, kind of. Kind of like that, but... A little more scary because you know you're getting into a combat zone. We get there in the middle of the night, so 
you can't see anything and all you see is like these concrete bomb shelters there there's sandbags so you know like come out of the plane you you know you're in a war zone like immediately you see like the barbed wire the hesco baskets and all that i mean you know right away that you're in a war zone i can tell you that even though you can't really see anything you're relatively safe where you're landing but at nighttime and if you've never been one thing that makes it real you can see all that stuff on tv but the one thing that makes it real is the smell <laughs> there's a lot of distinct smells and and that's what makes it real i just remember waking up that morning you get some food and they have you meet in the motor pool area with the unit like you go out to the motor pool and see the people you're going to be relieving and that was pretty crazy too. You, that was something that you remember like instantly because you go out into the motor pool and you see the vehicles that you're going to be using. You start seeing some of these vehicles and you're like, holy shit. I mean, you see the bullet holes in them. You can tell some have obviously been hit by IEDs. And I mean, so you know right away, like, damn, this shit's for real. The battle scarred vehicles brought Joe's expectations into a kind of strong relief. Something about the understanding that these trucks were intact but still showed signs of having been through hell stirred his interest. After all, this is pretty much specifically what he signed up for, and he was going to push it. He wanted to be mentally ready for the tasks that lay before him. He wanted to overcome the challenges, but most of all, he wanted to get into it with the enemy and then get through it. Functional, if just a little worse for wear, and he would get his chance almost immediately. There's a way inside the Bradley that you could hook a iPod into the jack so you could play like music when you have a headset on when you're inside the Bradley. And this dude's blaring music and he was blaring that song, Party Like a Rockstar, that Shop Boys song. He's blaring that as we're going outside the gate. So you're like amping you up. He, this dude was a freaking lunatic. I mean, he's like yelling and screaming. I remember thinking like, man, am I going to end up being like this by the end of my tour? And of course, sure enough, I did end up like that. But <laughs> there's an edge to the guy right away. And we're going out, you know, and he's screaming at people outside the turret. I'm thinking this dude is nuts because I'm looking at and seeing what's going on as soon as we go outside the wire. There's something almost cinematic about it. Jumping up in a Bradley fighting vehicle and blaring aggressive music as you head out the gates into what almost certainly will be dangerous situation after dangerous situation. It's not a coincidence. In fact, quite the opposite. For context, these are relatively young guys driving out to sweep for IEDs, improvised explosive devices. Tied up in their mission is the likelihood of them being attacked or at least finding a few IEDs. They're hooked up to cell phones so that they can be detonated remotely. This means that anyone holding a cell phone may as well be treated as if they're holding a gun. Add to that the notion that they have to be ready for pretty much anything else, and it makes sense to use music and screaming to get the adrenaline going, to kind of jumpstart your senses, and to get ready for battle. It's one of the difficulties Joe would encounter once he was out, the recognition that he spent more than a year between near-constant adrenaline rushes and bone-crushingly boring downtime in between missions. It's an odd kind of roller coaster that's difficult to prepare for and even a little more difficult to just switch off. The practice in the Army is to slowly integrate new troops in with the old troops that are being relieved so that the new guys and old guys ride together in different mixes until the relief soldiers are up to speed. Then, the battle-worn guys are cycled out. Within six months, Joe would be the one screaming and blasting music on the way out of the wire, and a wide-eyed new arrival would be wondering at his aggression. But, as I said, it was all with a purpose. And we weren't even outside two hours, and an ID went off, and, and that was... That was a moment that changes you immediately and set the tone for my entire deployment. You know, that ID went off and we're not really sure who it was meant for. We were usually in the second vehicle. In that case, we were on the first mission. We weren't sure if it was intended for us or the lead vehicle when it went off in between us. But in the oncoming lane, there was a bus coming and, and that ID ended up blasting the side of this bus with civilians in the bus. And there was, there was definitely some casualties in there. You know, so we stopped. And, and that was, you know, again, that's setting the tone for your entire deployment. And that was something I'll, I'll never forget. I remember it went off in between us. And the thing is, when an IED goes off, at least for me, and you, you feel it immediately, like, in your eyeballs. 
that's where I always felt like your eyes and your chest are where I always felt it like immediately. And it kind of like takes your breath away and like you just you feel this pressure in your eyes. And, you know, it's a huge cloud of dust. You can't really see real well at first because, you know, I mean, there's just dusty, you know, area over there to begin with. And when something like that goes off, I mean, it just kicks up dust like you can't even imagine. And when the dust kind of starts to settle, you see this bus. And I mean, the whole side of the bus, the glass is all shattered. People are screaming, kind of trying to assess the situation. Then, like, I see all these civilians running, like, because, you know, we're taught to keep our convoy secure. Like, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to start shooting or what. And... (laughs) The guy who was our Bradley commander, he's like, just relax. He's like, they're coming out here to help the people on the bus. There was chaos at the scene. People rushing all over, trying to help the injured and clear the damage. Lives were changed forever that day. Someplace in Iraq, one of the people maimed in the attack remembers it every day. For the soldiers, in addition to just having had a near-miss IED attack, there was the rush of people, one of whom could easily have been the attacker, moving in without regard for the armored vehicles that stood between them and the wounded. And they were. And, you know, there was there was some casualties on the bus. The two that I saw, there was a, a baby that was was cut up pretty good. I, I don't believe those injuries were fatal. And then there was a, a young boy, I'm guessing anywhere from 10 to 12. He comes, like, out. I don't know if it was his dad or his grandfather was, like, holding his shoulder. The kid's holding his eye, and he pulls his eye away, and his eye's kind of, like, hanging there. I mean, and so... You know, like I said, it set the tone. I mean, it wasn't all blood and guts like that my entire deployment, but to have that your first within your first two hours on your first mission, I mean, it's, it's eye-opening. You know, you realize, like, this is no joke. Eventually, the soldiers secured the area and helped the civilians help the wounded. Then, they mounted up and moved on. As Joe said, it wasn't blood and guts every day, but this was not the only incident by far. There were IEDs every day, sometimes two, Sometimes there would be more. Sometimes they would go off, and sometimes they wouldn't. Sometimes they would be disarmed. Sometimes they would be duds. The point is, this wasn't an odd experience. This was a regular work day. It went like this. Look for IEDs, find them, or have them find you. Deal with whatever happens when there's an explosion, and then move along. If there was an attack, it was dealt with as part of the mission, but the mission didn't end there. After all, A bus explosion would end most work days, but not when you're on an IED sweeping mission. It was just one of the things that happened at work that day. Yeah, kind of. I mean, and then there were times we would just clear routes to clear them, you know, because it's almost like cleanup. The first six months we were there, if we didn't get contact or find IEDs on a mission, that was that was rare. We found so many, man. It really kind of blends together. But we found them like right away. I mean, we're finding IEDs on on all the missions immediately. It wasn't like we. We went out a few times and didn't find anything. I mean, we were finding several IEDs every time we went out. So it kind of all blends together. Actually shooting people down or anything, I, I, it was never like that. But we'd fire warning shots. I'd spray a building up. Don't ever ask a, a service person if they've killed someone. That's just not a, a good thing to ask them. Cause, and I'll be, I'll be straight with you. I don't know if I ever did or didn't. That wasn't really my type of mission. When I was shooting, I was usually spraying a building or firing warning shots. But, you know... I laid down a lot of rounds, I can tell you that. It seems an odd thing not to know whether or not you've taken a human life, but it's more common than you might think. For members of the armed forces who are in charge of laying down cover fire or warning fire, it is a question that they just won't ever have the answers to. And the whys of it don't really matter, but it is critical to understand that what can weigh on you is the fact of the possibility. Joe didn't want to be asked not because he knows or doesn't know, but because people don't get into the army to kill. They get into the army to serve. In the last two decades of war in the Middle East, a lot of people have laid down a lot of fire. A lot of soldiers didn't make it home. No one wants to talk about killing, because, really, what's the point? This one's this was kind of tough, uh, but I will bring it up because it was kind of crazy. There was a kid who was giving hand and arm signals. Our platoon leader actually had told me to fire a warning shot his way, but it was kind of crazy. We had just gotten this vehicle. I'd never had a chance to zero in the sights. When I took it to the test fire pit, I couldn't really tell where it was shooting. It looked like it was shooting way to the right. So I kind of put my reticle right on the kid, thinking that it was going to shoot to the right. Well, here, it was actually the weapon was zeroed in. Thankfully, it, 
it just silhouetted the kid, scared the shit out of him, but uh, did not hit him, thankfully, because that's something that would have been tough to live with. It was kind of a crazy circumstance. We thought this kid was giving hand and arm signals to, to alert some insurgents, but here it ended up looking like he was trying to help us, which was a pretty uh, crazy experience. I mean, hesitation and all that, I mean, that could get you killed, so... On a human level, you know, especially when I got back, it bothered me more than it did at the time. I mean, you don't have time to think about that shit when you're over there. It's, it's on to the next mission. And so that was Joe's deployment, a mixture of getting amped up, seeing and enduring a few hours of combat, returning fire at length when fired upon, discovering IEDs in the easier hard ways, resting up, and doing it all again. All adrenaline, all the time outside the wire, and finding ways to burn it off back at the base. Joe felt different, though, but he didn't get a good sense of how he was changing until his mid-tour leave. In the Army, you're deployed for a few months, take a vacation back home, and return to finish your tour. For Joe, it would turn out to be an experience that would completely undo all of his future plans in the military. This is War is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Joe had dreamed of becoming a military man all his life. He got a college degree and joined up. At 25, he was older than most of the other recruits, but thanks to his degree, he was able to come in as an army specialist rather than as a private. Joe was quickly placed into a leadership role and rose to the occasion. Many enlistees with college degrees find themselves in a similar position. They receive specialized, on-the-job training that gets them combat ready so that they can keep our country safe. But when it comes time to settle back into civilian life, even veterans with degrees can have a hard time translating that military experience into a fulfilling civilian career. That's why many veterans and employers alike trust ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter knows that every business needs qualified talent and that as an employer, you need a smarter way to find the right job candidates for you. Veteran job candidates are far more likely to face unemployment than non-veteran job candidates. ZipRecruiter is committed to ensuring all people, particularly those who face unique challenges when looking for work, have the opportunity to find meaningful employment. To help the veteran community, ZipRecruiter has partnered with companies that support veterans as they make their transition into civilian careers. If you're an employer looking for top-notch talent, including our nation's veterans, ZipRecruiter is the place to find it. ZipRecruiter finds qualified candidates for you. ZipRecruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies people with the right experience, and invites them to apply for your job. That's why 80% of employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. The right candidates are out there. ZipRecruiter is how you find them. You can use ZipRecruiter to find great job candidates today. And right now, listeners to This Is War can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash this is war. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash this is war. One more time, to try for free, go to ZipRecruiter.com slash this is war. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. The shine came off of mid-tour leave pretty quickly for Joe. He was met by his folks at the airport, and they'd brought him a hoagie and a yingling, and he enjoyed them both greedily on his car ride home. He traveled in uniform as is required of soldiers, so it wasn't until he was in the front yard of his parents' home that he had his first opportunity to take off his boots and walk barefoot in the grass. It was late summer 2007, most of the way through the most violent year in the war in Iraq so far. Joe got some sleep, met up with some friends, and spent some time with his family, but it started to have something of a hollow feel. It wasn't that he didn't enjoy it, it was that he already was getting a sense that his experience in Iraq had changed him more fundamentally than he had been prepared to have it do. It was a really tough realization. Going home wasn't good for me. It would have been better if they would, like I said, sent me to like Thailand or something like that. But going home was, that was tough. In the middle of a combat tour and you go home for almost three weeks, it's like being thrown into a pool of ice water, you know, doing the polar plunge. It's just a shock to your system. After that, I knew it was just, it was probably time to move on from the army. 
This was kind of like the first ever digital age war. I had an external hard drive full of all kinds of like videos and pictures and shit of stuff we did and you know, bombs we found. And guys made like cut up videos with like music to them and stuff of like IEDs. And I remember showing that to some of our friends. And the one thing that really stuck out with that was my dad actually asked me to, to see the one video that I was showing people that one of the guys put together and sitting at the computer and my dad's watching. And I forget how long the video is. It's maybe like five minutes long, 10 minutes long. And I remember when it was done, I just remember seeing the look on my dad's face and you could tell, I wouldn't say it was fear. It was just kind of shock. I just remember him saying, man, that's really hard for a father to see. So that stuck with me. What Joe's father probably knew And what Joe has since learned is that there's a personal sacrifice that comes with enduring months and months of war. It isn't the time away from home or the missed opportunities in the civilian world, or really even the overriding fact that being in a war zone is inherently physically dangerous. Although all of those things are, of course, the case. The sacrifice is the shell you have to grow, emotionally, to normalize being a witness to violence in combat. It's a natural reaction, to adapt psychologically as well as physically to your environment, but the human mind is slow to stand down after the threat of anger. What Tom knew about his son's experience, as much from the five-minute video as from being around him, was that the war already had started to change his son. And over the rest of the tour, he would continue the transformation from someone who was not used to living in a combat zone to someone for whom daily threats were a way of life. He knew that the road back from that would be very difficult. It's hard, man, hard to leave. But you wanted to go back, too. It's it's like you're being pulled in two different directions or in a thousand different directions, really. You don't really have time to sort through all that stuff. That's why I said it's like being thrown into, like, a pool of ice water. It's a lot to deal with. You don't really have time to compute all of it. It's just, and then you're going back and... You go from somewhere that's really safe to a war zone, and it's pretty much overnight, you know. It's not easy to adjust one way or the other. They warn you about it before you get back, and they they won't let you go on mission right away. Like, you kind of got to ramp back up. I got, like, pretty depressed, and I'm not someone who gets depressed very often, but when after I went home, and, you know, it's a lot to ask of your friends and family, too. You know, that was the other thing. I'm very close with friends and family. Seeing how much it weighed on them took a toll on me as well. That's a lot to ask of your your friends and family. While he didn't go right back to the grind, after getting reacclimated to Iraq and the million ways it was less safe than Pennsylvania, Joe was back in the Bradley and out sweeping for IEDs. The two things that stuck out in his mind were the number of IEDs the company supposedly found seemed ridiculously low once he heard the final tally. He felt like they got a lot more than they got credit for. Alternatively, the number of casualties was also low. They did lose one man from the company, but no U.S. soldiers had been killed on any of the routes that his unit cleared during the 15 months he was deployed. Joe was really proud of that, but soldiers were occasionally killed in other ways, and the news of casualties could hit everybody pretty hard. You never knew what was going to happen when you step outside the wire. The one LT we had, he was a former Marine. He was always good at putting that stuff in perspective, you know, when we had a few KIAs and stuff, he would always say like, Hey, look, you know, that, that person didn't go outside the wire today thinking that was going to be their, their last day on earth. And that's the gravity of what you're doing. Um, I told you before too, there were days where I felt like I just knew it. I could feel it in my bones. I was going to die that day. And I don't know how to explain that to anybody. I never really conveyed it to people when I was over there, you know, being a sergeant, I didn't want any of my soldiers to know that. And even my, you know, my buddies that were, you know, counterparts, this is not something you really want to talk about anyhow. But there were days where I just felt like, you know, they're going to pull my card today. Thankfully, that didn't happen. That was an intense feeling. And like I said, I I don't know how to explain that to people either, because I could literally, I could just feel it in my bones. That was going to be my last day. And that's the thing about combat. You never know when your last day is going to be and you don't know if it will end with you alive and uninjured, or something worse than that. In the meantime, all you can do is do your job and help the other guys do theirs. As soon as we got outside the wire, there was like two big like drag marks of blood. I think some operators like zip lined down out of a chopper and, and shot two guys just outside the wire. I kind of 
started and ended my tour in the same manner, you know, with a lot of violence. <laughs> I do remember we had a young guy with us and it was his first mission ever. He was in the unit that was relieving us. I remember our LT was like, hey man, look out your window. Like you're going to see your first dead body. And, and you couldn't really see it. You could just see like his feet. And he's like, oh, you missed it. <laughs> And I could just, I remember looking at that kid's face, man. Like he's, and he had probably the same look I had. And I, you know, I didn't get to see my own face, obviously, but he had that holy shit look in his face. <laughs> it was like, when was the next day or the day after? I can't recall. But I remember I was actually getting ready to jump in the, in the truck. And my LT came up to me. He's like, hey, Post, your war's over. And uh, that's a feeling that, that I'll never forget. It was like, I, it was just a cooling sensation from head to toe, and it felt wonderful, man. It was like, holy shit, I'm actually going to make it out of this son of a bitch alive. <laughs> and he did. Joe Post made his way back to the States, but in his head, he was still in Iraq. He didn't feel like he was there in a literal way, but more in a habitual way. Think of it like this. His life and the lives of his unit depended upon him doing certain things regularly and predictably. That isn't the kind of thing you can just turn off. You develop a hypervigilance from the first time you deploy with a very strict understanding that a lapse can cost you or your buddies their lives. There are no I'm sorry's for mistakes, only consequences for dropping your guard. If there's any advantage of being ill-prepared for a crisis, your brain can't imagine what it could be. You know, when you first get back driving down the road, it can be an interesting experience for someone who was on a route clearance team. You see trash on the side of the road, you swerve around it, because that's what you do over there, you know? Or you don't drive over a pothole, or someone coming up to you quick in a vehicle, you know, it freaks you out. I mean, it's, I remember there was a car accident. This was within my first week of being home when I was back at Fort Hood. And it scared the living shit out of me. I freaking floored it and got the hell out of there. <laughs> it's tough to it's tough to ever really put that to words, I, I think. As part of the discharge process, Joe underwent a brief, somewhat perfunctory PTSD screening. He got the all clear and started preparing to re-enter his life. The thing is, there wasn't much for him to do. By the time he got home in April 2009, the economy was still listless and there weren't a lot of jobs to be had. But even if there had been, Joe wasn't 100% sure of what he wanted to do. After all, for most of his life he had envisioned himself as a career army person. But as he looked back at his service and forward with what he wanted to do with his life, he no longer could muster the desire to be a professional soldier. Initially, when I first deployed, I was planning on staying in, whether I was going to stay enlisted or go to officer candidate school, I wasn't sure. But I, my initial plan was to stay in the Army. But one of the biggest reasons I got out, I mean, there, again, there were several, but I didn't like the person I was becoming. I was getting very cold and numb to things that, that you probably shouldn't get cold and numb towards, you know. And then when you come home, that's a lot to reconcile with, you know. At the time when it's going on, it's a survival mechanism. So you're doing whatever you have to do to survive. But when you come home, you know, it's it's a lot to download. I would say that it's made me appreciative of a lot more things, for sure. Joe toyed briefly with the notion of becoming a cop, but decided instead to look into going back to college and finding something else there. The whole time, though, he just wasn't feeling right. He was self-medicating, getting into minor scrapes, and generally having a tough go of it. It's one thing to be a victim of PTSD in an over-the-top obvious kind of way. But Joe's symptoms were clear to him personally, if subtly. In addition to the PTSD-induced panic attacks, anger, and sleeplessness, Joe also suffered from a cultural malady, one that held that therapy generally, and PTSD specifically, were symptoms of a mental weakness. It was a character flaw, not a proper ailment like a scar or a missing limb. Joe retreated into self-medication, mostly drinking, but also the trappings of heavy drinking, the occasional fight or one-night stand, or both. He was lucky on a lot of fronts. The first was that he avoided any life-altering mistakes, and he came out on the other side. The second was that he was called up for additional duty, 
where we ran into a guy who reread his file and got his diagnosis changed. Joe eventually found his way into therapy, which is the healthiest, safest way to adjust a combat veteran's mind back from war zone to home front mentality. The one thing I've learned with PTSD is that, like, one thing that kind of drives me nuts with it, I, like, you see the stuff like they put on TV or like how they portray these guys on TV shows. Like, it's some dude who's like acts all like skitzy and crazy, and that's not. I mean, I'm sure there's guys that are like that, but that's. You know, you don't look at someone with PTSD and be like, you don't look at them and say like, oh, I can tell that person has it by looking at them. You don't know that. And it wasn't until actually I was home for a year that I got diagnosed. I mean, I, I kind of knew that already, you know, I did a little research on my own things, you know, the hypervigilance, the panic attacks and stuff. Like I never even knew what the hell a panic attack was and, until I got one. Like, and I didn't even know what it was for a while. It took me a while to figure out that I was actually getting panic attacks. I don't like to talk about it, if that makes sense, because it is a little embarrassing for me. It is. And I know people say, oh, you shouldn't be embarrassed. But for, for my personality and the way I am, it, it is a little embarrassing because I consider myself, you know, pretty mentally tough person. You know, it's something that sticks with me. Sometimes I would just start crying for no reason. And I'm not someone who cries. I would just start, like, bawling. What the, what the hell is this shit, you know? And I didn't know why. I You know, it's something I still try to f- figure out. I mean... It's something that I think you kind of struggle with forever, in a way. Now, of course, it gets better, and, you know, I feel a lot more comfortable back home now. Coming home for good, that was the hardest thing I ever did. War. We leave the police station, and we're all dismounted, walking from the police station to our trucks who were on their way. They had circled up, you know, driving in a line towards us. They were still not there yet. They were off. So as you walk out of the police station, the trucks are driving up so we can hop in and go. So we're walking from the police station to the trucks. That's when the ambush started. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. To find a link to subscribe to This Is War, show notes, and more information, simply tap or swipe over the cover art. You'll also see offers from our sponsors. Please help support our shows by supporting them. If you like what you've heard, We'd love it if you would give us a five-star rating and review. And be sure to tell your friends and show them how to subscribe. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com survey. Are you a combat veteran or do you know one with a story to tell? Reach out to us at stories at thisiswar.com with your dates and branch of service and a brief description of the experience you'd like to share. If you would like to hear more of This Is War and other Wondery shows, in addition to extra content, early access, and exclusive perks, you can subscribe at Wondery Plus. Go to wondery.com slash plus. I'm Anthony Russo. This Is War was produced by Incongruity Media. Executive producer, Hernan Lopez for Wondery. If you're a veteran suffering from PTSD or suicidal thoughts, please visit veteranscrisisline.net or call 1-800-273-TALK. That is 1-800-273-8255. You also can text VeteransCrisisLine.net at 838-255.